Welcome to the third tutorial on dynamic system modeling and control. Um, in this tutorial, we're going to discuss the state space representation of system dynamics, and uh, we're going to dive into what it means to create such a state space representation and uh, go through examples of such a state space representation. Again, my name is Hossein Fethi, and I'm happy to be going through this tutorial with you. The goals of this tutorial are to introduce state variables, that's number one. Number two, to introduce the concept of a memory operator. Number three, to introduce integration with respect to time as one specific memory operator that is particularly relevant to uh, system dynamics, especially for continuous time systems. And number four, to introduce the continuous time state space model and uh, how it builds on this memory operator, integration with respect to time. So with that in mind, before we go into state variables, memory operators, and state space models, um, what I would like to do is I would like to go back to the previous tutorial on dynamic systems. I would like to go back to this idea that intuitively a system is a collection of components that have non-trivial interactions among them, not necessarily synergistic, and have a well-defined boundary separating the system from its environment. I want to go back to this idea that when you look at this picture um, of a, a system, you notice that from a mathematical perspective, the one thing that really matters is that we have inputs denoted by u of t, outputs denoted by y of t, and mathematically, the system is a mapping between the time independent, the time dependent inputs u of t, to the time dependent outputs y of t. And this, system, this definition of a system is the causal definition, where the input is the cause and the output is the effect. In other words, a system is dynamic, if and only if it has memory. This idea leads us to the following way, the following approach for modeling dynamic systems. I have to, I have to say that this is perhaps one of the most common, if not the most common, approaches for modeling system dynamics. But it's not the only uh, approach or tool or language that we use for modeling dynamic systems. But the, the so-called state space representation that I'm going to share with you shortly is indeed one of the most common representation for system dynamics. I'm going to focus on systems that can be represented using what is known as a lumped parameter model. What we're going to find out is that the term lumped parameter model represents a state space model where the number of states is finite. We don't have an infinite continuum of dynamics and an infinite continuum of parameters. For example, uh, this uh, state space representation that I'm going to share with you is going to allow us to model, say, the vibrations of a discrete mass, a lumped mass, um, mounted on a lumped spring. But it's going to not necessarily be directly or immediately conducive to the modeling of vibrations of, say, a plate, where there is an infinite number of masses and an infinite number of springs. So in a dynamic system, such as, for example, um, a person who is ice skating or figure skating, the first kind of variable that we need to think about is the input variable or set of input variables. There are two kinds of input variables that we need to think about. We need to think about control inputs, and those are the inputs that the person who is ice skating is actually exerting on the ice skating system in order to achieve a certain desired response. So the control input is an input that you as a control engineer are able to tailor, are able to adjust, are able to control, are able to use for control purposes. Okay, We need to distinguish between control inputs on the one hand and exogenous inputs on the other hand, sometimes known as disturbances. An exogenous input is an input that the environment exerts on you as a system that you have no control over, that you can't change, that you just have to accept is going to happen and you have no power over that exogenous input. For example, a wind gust is an exogenous input. Uh, if you're ice skating and somebody decides to give you a little push, um, the push that you get from that person, that is an exogenous input. So while previously, before this slide and before this tutorial, we lumped all of our inputs under U of T, now we're going to make a distinction between control inputs that we as control engineers have the power to dictate, U of T, and exogenous inputs that somebody else dictates that we do not have that power to dictate, W of T.
A dynamic system also has output variables and we're going to denote them by y of t. But in addition to input and output variables, there's this idea that a dynamic system has memory. There's this idea that a dynamic system represents the past internally, somehow is able to store and remember the past. So we're going to say that the system has memory variables that are internal to it. The term memory variables is not the common name used for these variables. We call them state variables. That is the more common name. These state variables represent the system's memory or recollection of the past. And we're going to denote them by x of t. Our goal as control systems and dynamic systems engineers is to come up with a mathematical representation for the dynamics of the system that captures the relationships between the input variables, whether control inputs or exogenous inputs, the output variables, and the memory variables. In the coming slides, I'm going to lump all the inputs back under U of T, so W of T is going to vanish. However, um, you need to remember that there is often a distinction between control inputs and exogenous inputs. Sometimes we neglect that distinction and we lump all the inputs under U of T, and sometimes we make the distinction explicit. What I want is I want a relationship a mathematical relationship, a mathematical representation between state variables, input variables, and output variables. That's what I call a model of a dynamic system. And if you think about how to build such a model, one of the most important steps towards building such a model is to represent this idea of memory, that the state of the system is memory of the past, that it remembers the past, it keeps a record of the past. I need a mathematical operator that allows me to represent memory, the ability to remember the past. So before we can build a dynamic system model, we need a memory operator. Now, what's really interesting here is that there is no unique choice of memory operators. If you go to the math literature and you look for different operators that allow you to represent memory, you'll see that there are multiple operators, distinct operators, that can serve this purpose that are called memory operators. There are different choices of memory operators and some of them are actually very popular. And these different popular choices of memory operators lead to different bodies of fundamental knowledge. For example, um, delaying a signal in time by a discrete amount of time, okay? Or marching a signal forward in time by a discrete amount of time that operator, the time shift operator, can be used as a memory operator, okay? Obviously, if you take a signal from the past and you delay it into the future, you're actually remembering it. So the time delay operator is a memory operator um, in that sense. That memory operator, the time shift operator, is the foundation for a certain body of knowledge, body of fundamental knowledge, called discrete time dynamic system theory or discrete time control sy systems theory. Taking information from the past and queuing it to create a queue is a memory operator. And we can think about, uh, you know, queuing theory as a theory that deals with, to some extent, at least on a very superficial level, memory and the ability to remember previous inputs. Here in these tutorials, we're focusing on continuous time dynamic systems our memory operator is going to be integration with respect to time. Taking a signal and integrating it with respect to time is going to be our fundamental memory operator in everything that we do. I know that this is a bit of a philosophical discussion, so I want to move from this philosophical discussion to an example that illustrates the role of integration with respect to time as a memory operator. I'm going to use a wishing well example, and I've uh, here's a little picture borrowed from Wikimedia Commons of a wishing well. Now, every day, you know, people walk by this wishing well and they throw pennies in it or something, and uh, the wishing well accumulates the money that they throw. Hopefully, most wishing wells are associated with um, charitable foundations that then collect this money and use it for the common good. So, the input to the wishing well is the money influx, and I'm going to pretend that that's a continuous influx because I'm dealing with uh, continuous dynamic systems, dynamic systems where the dynamics evolve continuously in time, continuous time dynamic systems. So I'm going to pretend that the input is money influx in dollars per second, and I'm going to say that the output, the thing the system gives me as a function of time, 
is the amount of money accumulated in the wishing well in dollars. Now the question is, what is the state variable? How does the system remember the past? Where is the memory of the past? Well, if you think about it, the money accumulated is the memory of the past. If I put in a dollar one day and a dollar the next day and a dollar the third day into the wishing well, or, you know, 50 cents one day and a quarter the next day, and I accumulate all the money that I've, add, that I've thrown into the wishing well as a function of time, that accumulation is in some sense a recollection of the past. Now you notice something interesting. The total amount of money accumulated in the well does not form a recollection of everything. I do not, by recalling the amount of money accumulated in the well, I cannot remember whether this money was thrown into the well yesterday or the day before or the day before that. But at least I'm remembering something. I'm remembering that all in all, you know, all the people who've walked past this well have thrown in, let's say, $3.77. So that quantity is a state variable. It, is, it represents the memory of the wishing well. So the money accumulated is memory. And if you notice that money accumulated is the integral over all time, from time going all the way back to negative infinity, from the beginning of time, whatever the beginning of time means, it's the accumulation over all time up until this moment up until little t of the money influx at every instant in time u of tau integrated with respect to time d tau. And you notice something really interesting here. This integral is acting with respect to time. This integral with respect to time is acting as a memory operator. If we differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to time, we get that x dot as a function of time is equal to u of t. We call and we get the other equation, of course, relating the output to the state is that y is equal to x of t. So I'm pretending here that u of t, money influx, because it's an input, is given. I need an equation for x of t. Well, I don't have an equation for x of t, but I have an equation for x dot, and I can integrate that to get x of t, assuming I have the initial conditions. Or if I march all the way back to negative infinity, I can assume that infinitely back in time there was no money in the wishing well. And I have an equation for y of t. So I have two equations and two unknowns, one for the state variable and one for the input variable. And that's all I need because I'm assuming, one for the output variable. And that's all I need because I'm assuming that the input variable is given. This first equation is called the state equation because it gives me an expression for the state, at least the rate of change of the state with respect to time as a function of the input. The second equation is called the output equation because it gives me the output as a function of the state variable. So that's one very simple example, a wishing well. What can we do with a wishing well to make it a little more interesting? Well, we can create a wishing well with interest, so a wishing well that accrues interest. Uh, of course, the real analogy here is some sort of a charitable foundation that, um, that accepts donations into an account that can accrue interest as a function of time. In this case, the input is still the money influx in dollars per second, but I have a new parameter. Um, it's a constant parameter, alpha, my interest rate. The output is still the money accumulated at any instant in time. The state variable is still the money accumulated at any instant in time. But the way interest works is that the amount of money in the bank as a function of time grows in proportion to the amount of money in the bank at any instant in time by interest, so x dot rate of change of money in the bank is equal to alpha times x plus u, okay? The output y is still equal to x. The first equation is still called the state equation. The second equation is still called the output equation. The th main thing that has changed is that in the previous slide, x dot was equal to just u of t. Now x dot is alpha times x plus u of t. So this is a slightly more sophisticated model but it still has the same structure and I can still call it a state space model of this dynamic system. Now let me make things a little more interesting. I'm gonna take this wishing well and I'm gonna pretend that it's not really a wishing well, it's a bank account that carries interest, but the bank that the account is, uh, is with has this policy that the more money you have in your account the slightly higher your interest rate. So they give slightly bigger accounts, a bigger interest rate, okay? Specifically, alpha is now a deposit-dependent interest rate, so it's not constant anymore. It's equal to some constant alpha naught 
plus another constant alpha 1 times x. So the bigger your deposit, x of t, the bigger your interest rate. The input is still the same, money influx in dollars per second. The output is still the same, money accumulated in dollars. The state variable is still the same, money accumulated. But the state equation is now x dot is equal to alpha x plus u, the same as before, but now alpha is a function of x, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it out. I'm going to say x dot is equal to the constant alpha naught times x plus alpha 1 x squared plus u of t, and y is equal to x of t. Again, this is a slightly more complex model, if you will, if you want to use that word, but it still has the same structure. I still have a state equation that gives me x dot as a function of x and u, and I still have an output equation that gives me y as a function of x. Now, the final iteration of this example. I am going to take this wishing well, and I'm going to assume that it is funding a foundation that one day in the future is going to take all the money from the wishing well with all the accumulated interest and is going to use that money to buy a big plot of land, let's say a big community farm, to help a local community, um, let's say, with its food. That's the assumption. When they purchase this community farm, the amount of land that they're able to purchase, that is the output I care about. So things have changed a little bit here. I still have a deposit-dependent interest rate, same equation as the previous slide. But I'm going to be buying property with the deposit. So anytime I purchase property, I have to pay a fixed amount of money, a fixed cost, for the purpose of purchase of this property. Um, paperwork processing costs, closing costs, etc. I'm going to call that beta. And then, in addition to that fixed cost, there is a variable cost per unit property. I'm going to call that gamma. So this is the number of dollars per, let's say, uh, acre or the number of dollars per square meter or square foot of land that I'm buying. Okay? My input is still the money, the monetary influx in dollars per second. But my output Y of T is now the equivalent property. The amount of property I can buy for the given deposit. My state variable is still the money accumulated. My state equation remains exactly the same. x dot is alpha naught x plus alpha 1 x squared plus u of t. But my output equation has changed. Now I take the amount of money I have, x of t, subtract the fixed cost for the purchase of the property, beta, divide by the variable cost per unit property, gamma, and that gives me the amount of land I can buy with the current deposit, assuming that I have enough money to uh, both pay the fixed cost and then in addition to that purchase a little bit of land. Okay, So this is a more sophisticated set of state and output equations, but it still has the same structure. The state equation is of the form x dot is some function of x and u and it doesn't have to be a linear function. The output equation is of the form y is some function of x and it could be a function of u also and it doesn't have to be a linear function it could be a nonlinear function all of these examples have helped basically motivate the state space representation the state space representation allows us to represent the dynamics of many many dynamic systems continuous time dynamic systems using one single unified mathematical framework not every dynamic system in the world can be represented using this framework, but the framework is so general and so powerful that we can use it for so many different kinds of dynamic systems. The state space representation allows us to represent the dynamics of the system at hand by a set of state equations where the state variables x of t, their derivatives with respect to time, x dot of t, is some nonlinear or linear function of the state x of t the input u of t, and perhaps time. The output equation y of t gives us the output. The output equation gives us the output y of t as some function, perhaps linear, perhaps nonlinear, g, as a function of x of t, u of t, and t. In this case, the vector u of t represents the input variables, and we could have u and w if we had control inputs and exogenous inputs. The vector y of t represents the output variables, the vector x of t represents the state or memory variables. The function f is called the state function, and the equation x dot is equal to f of x and u and, and t 
is the state equation. And the function u is the output function. And the equation, uh, the function g is the output function, I apologize. And the equation y is equal to g of x and u um, is the output equation. Now, we have, we make a distinction in dynamic system theory between time invariant versus time varying systems. If the function f is actually a function of time, if it changes with time, and if the function g is a function of time, we have a time invariant, dyna time varying dynamic system. The system dynamics themselves are a function of time. Whereas if the functions f and g are just functions of x and u, not functions of x and u and time, then we have a time invariant dynamic system. This is a lot of detail, and um, you know I, I hope that you'll be able to absorb it and see how it applies to different kinds of systems in the coming tutorials. The important thing here is this. This is what I really need you to remember. When representing the dynamics of a system, we need to have some set of variables to represent the memory of the system. We call those the state variables, x of t. We represent the dynamics of continuous time, lumped parameter systems, where lumped parameter just means we have a finite number of state variables. We have a finite vector, x of t. We represent the dynamics of continuous time, lumped parameter systems with this equation, x dot is equal to f of x and u. What this equation says is that the way in which our memory changes as a function of time it depends, perhaps in a nonlinear manner, on the current value of the memory variables, the current value of the state, and the current value of the inputs. The output is a function of the state and the input. Well, what does that mean? It means that our output now is a function of our input now, u of t, and our state, x of t, which is our recollection of the past. So this is how we represent system dynamics. So the goals of this tutorial were to introduce state variables, introduce memory operators, and specifically integration with respect to time as a memory operator, and introduce the continuous time state space models. Now, what we want to do next is to learn how to model dynamic systems from various domains using the state space representation. How can I take the state space representation and use it to describe the dynamics of a mechanical system or an electrical system or thermal or hydraulic or a population system or an electrochemical system? So that's going to be the goal of the next tutorials. We're going to begin by applying the state space representation very specifically to modeling the dynamics of a mechanical system. And then we will go on from there to other kinds of engineering systems. Thank you very much for bearing with me. I know this has been a lot of information thrown at you in one tutorial. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the next tutorial.